Well, thank you all very much for having me here, and thank you to your professors who invited me to share Women's History Month with all of you. Can I just check, can you all hear me in the back okay? Okay. I'm used to screaming at my students, so uh, I imagine that you can hear me, but if you have trouble, just definitely let me know. So. Um, I love the title that you uh, have for your Women's History Month uh, here at CRC this year, Visionary Women Champions of Peace and Nonviolence. Okay. Um, and uh, I think that this is a, a particularly appropriate year for that topic. Uh, visionary women is appropriate any time, I would argue. Uh, but thinking of women's involvement in peace and nonviolence, we're at an actually important anniversary year here in uh, 2019. So we're not quite at the anniversary of the 19th Amendment of women's right to vote in the United States. But we are at the anniversary year of a very important international conference in 1919, which is the Paris Peace Conference. So I'm going to see if this will advance slides for me. Um, it does. Good. So I'm imagining maybe you heard about the Paris Peace Conference at some point from some teacher or professor of yours. This was the peace conference that came at the end of the First World War. Um, which had lasted for four and a half years. Ten million men had been killed over the course of the war. And probably if you learned anything about this peace conference from your teachers, it might have had something to do with these three men uh, whose pictures are on the screen there. Uh, do you guys recognize any of them? Yeah? Good, yeah, so somebody recognized Woodrow Wilson on the far right-hand side of the screen as you're looking at it, who was president of the United States during World War I and during this peace conference. Um, standing next to him in the middle with the fabulous mustache is Georges Clemenceau, who was the prime minister of France in 1919. And then on the far side, David Lloyd George, who was the prime minister of Great Britain. Um, you might have learned a little bit about the ideals with which these men sat down around the table with many others in 1919, hoping to finally bring peace to a war-torn world, promising democracy, promising social justice. Um, you may also have heard about the most famous of the treaties that was signed at the end of this peace process, which was the Versailles Treaty. Uh, this was a treaty that was signed with Germany that had been defeated in World War I and that demanded that they disarm, that they give up territory, that they help pay for the costs of the war, and that the Nazi party would use to great effect in their search to come to power um, uh, in the 1920s and especially in the 1930s. Now, it's possible that you even had teachers talk a little bit about the more broad global significance of this conflict, which completely redrew the map of Central Europe, creating new states like Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. It also drew the map of the modern Middle East, um, conjuring states up more or less out of thin air, the modern-day states of Iraq and Palestine, for example, um, uh, being drafted at the peace table in 1919. So a lot of really important global events happened at the time. I'm guessing if you learned anything, though, no matter what it is that you learned from your teachers, that you learned that this was, in and of itself, a man's peace. It was a piece that brought men to the table from all over the world, all around the world, and sat them down together in order to try and finally bring about an international order where peace would reign indefinitely, and millions of men wouldn't be sent to the trenches and sent to the slaughter. Um, but it's particularly ironic that this was a peace conference of men in starch collars and neckties claiming for the right to speak for the entire population of the world. Because World War I had not been just a man's war by any uh, stretch of the imagination. Granted, it had mostly been fought by male soldiers in the trenches and on the front lines, but there were women who carried guns and fought for their armies, most famously the group of women or a small portion of them up on the screen there who fought for the empire of Russia. Uh, in 1917, they formed what was known as the Women's Battalion of Death and who actually fought uh, on the Eastern Front of the First World War. It was also a war in which thousands and thousands of women volunteered to serve as nurses. 
Um, some of them at home, many of them in hospitals at the front lines. Um, other women also volunteered their services in other ways. Some, for example, served in the ambulance corps, American women and British women who drove ambulances carrying men from where they were wounded in battle back to the hospitals behind the lines. There were other women like the African American women in the upper corner there who served with the YMCA and who helped make sure that soldiers were taken care of uh, when they were on leave in Europe. And then there were even more, there were literally millions of women who participated in this war from the home front, either serving um, in, in farms, bringing in the food that allowed armies to continue to fight over the course of this very long drawn out conflict, and many others who entered into munitions factories, making the shells, making the guns, making the tanks that allowed this uh, war to function. Now, women volunteered and served in this war in part out of the same reason that men did. They did it out of a sense of service to their nation. They did it out of a sense of patriotism. But women also had their own very specific reason that was different than men's, or at least some women did, for engaging in the war. And that is to say that many of these women had political aspirations. They hoped that in proving that they were loyal and patriotic and would serve, could and would serve their nation, that at the end of the war, male statesmen and male voters would recognize that they deserved the rights of full citizenship, and in particular that they deserved the right to vote and to help make the laws that would determine whether there would be any future wars. And in some cases, there was a fair amount of reason for optimism. So that, for example, President Wilson, whose picture we saw a moment ago on the screen, who had been absolutely opposed to giving American women the vote through most of his political life, changed his mind over the course of World War I. And in 1917, he finally said publicly that he supported giving women the right, uh, the right to vote here in America. And the next year, he even said that he supported the idea of an amendment to the Constitution, guaranteeing women that right to vote. Um, British women in 1918, before the war was over, won the right to vote as long as they were 30 years old or older. So there were signs by the time that the war was coming to an end that women were making progress on this front, and it led them uh, in this kind of rising era of expectations as the war was coming to a close to argue that they should be seated at the peace table that it did not make sense in this huge, world-important event, these peace negotiations that were going to determine the future of the global order, that women not play a part. And so women in Great Britain and in the United States and in Canada as well, they all began drafting petitions and contacting their leaders and saying, we expect to have a seat at the table. We women expect to be part of these peace negotiations. And um, what you see up on the screen there right now is an article that ran in the New York Times on November 9th, 1918, so two days before the armistice, before the war was officially over, and it's talking about American suffragists, women who were fighting for the vote, who um, contacted Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States, and urged him to give women adequate representation on the United States delegation to the Peace Conference. And down here, Mrs. Catt, uh, uh, Car Carrie Chapman Catt, who was the head of the Suffrage Society, said that never had the National Suffrage Association offered any suggestion which had received such strong and immediate response as this one for having women represented at the Peace Conference. So this was a hugely popular idea among American women. They thought it um, was only right, given the contributions they had made to the peace effort, and women in Europe and elsewhere felt, uh, felt similarly. Um, in the end, they were all turned down. Woodrow Wilson actually just never answered their pleas. And uh, David Lloyd George said he didn't have time to think about it to British women. So they all were turned down. And of the approximately 30 allied nations that participated in the peace negotiations, all of them refused to appoint a woman as part of their peace de delegation except for one. 
and that one exception was China. China was the only country of all of the Allied powers that chose a woman to be part of its official peace delegation that it sent to Paris as part of this process in 1919. And the woman that they chose was an absolutely remarkable woman with a revolutionary past behind her and with a bright future in front of her. She would later become the first female lawyer in China, the first female judge in China, be part of the woman who helped draft the civil code in China. She was a woman by the name of Sumei Cheng, or at least that's how she was known in the West. Cheng Yushu is her given name, and her uh, married name would later become Madam Wei Tao Ming. So that giveaway that uh, your professor told you about is the memoir that, or one of the memoirs she wrote of her life. And it's a great story. So I hope you all have a chance to read it, even those that don't win it uh, here today. Um, so I'm going to focus the rest of my talk here with you today on Sumei Chang and on China, which is not the country we often most focus on in the Paris peace negotiations. And in telling her story, I want to kind of achieve four goals at the same time. Um, so one is just that I want to share with you the life of a visionary woman who's been completely forgotten in history. She literally, her whole story was wiped from the historical record. And um, in fact, that biography of hers was only translated into Chinese a couple years ago. And um, her story is just now being revived in China. Um, so I'm restoring this woman to the historical record. I want to talk a little bit about why it is that this woman who came to a peace conference and who was championing peace on some level um, took as her role model probably the most famous female warrior in Chinese history, which is to say Mulan, um, which is why the title of my talk is as it is. Um, I want to outline the links that uh, Su Mei Cheng went to to defend Chinese interests in Paris in 1919. And then I want to explain why it is that Cheng's activism in Paris in 1919, which on the surface really seemed to mostly be about nationalism and defending China, was in fact also about feminism and defending women's rights in a modern, modern nation state. So we're going to try and pack all of that in into the next uh, 30 minutes or so uh, in the remainder of my lecture. So before I start in on Sumei Cheng's story, I want to give you a little bit of historical background on China. I don't know if you're all Chinese history experts in this room or not, but just in case you're not, just so we know what we're talking about here. So at the time of the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, um, China had, at least by name, a Republican government, but that government was only about seven years old. So China, all the way from the middle of the 17th century, all the way up until 1912, was ruled by a hereditary dynasty known as the Qing Dynasty. And the parameters on the map there, the kind of outline you see, is roughly the size of China under the Qing Dynasty. So this was like all dynastic re regimes. It was autocratic. The emperor held all the power. Um, he lived most of his life within the walls of the Forbidden City in Beijing, did not have a lot of contact with the people, and, um, and then passed the right to rule on down to the, ma the male family line. Now, the Qing dynasty, when it first came to power in the 17th century and for quite some time thereafter, was very efficient, very effective. In fact, um, there were points in time early on when the dynasty was running so well that the government actually um, canceled taxes for the year. They were just so flush with money, they didn't even need to collect anyone's taxes. So early on, it was very successful. But over the decades and over the centuries, it grew increasingly corrupt less responsive to the people, and it also faced a lot of challenges from the outside. And this is important for understanding the story, because beginning in the 19th century, European powers and the Americans, and then later the Japanese, all began showing up on the shores off of China uh, with big boats loaded with guns, pointed those guns at the Chinese shores and said, we want better trading rights or else. 
And so bit by bit, the Chinese began to learn, uh, lose a lot of economic power to these outside states and even to lose some territory um, as these outside powers gained what were called concessions, which was territory within China, but where foreigners could do more or less whatever they wanted. So that by the late 19th and early 20th century, the Chinese Qing dynasty no longer was able to effectively govern this whole state. And there were advisors to the Chinese emperors who said, you know, we've got to reform, we've got to do things differently if we're not going to completely lose out altogether. Um, but the Qing uh, rulers were kind of old fashioned, they didn't really respond to this need for change. And so over time, um, Chinese reformers began to think, you know what? we're not going to be able to reform the system from within. If we're going to reach, regain Chinese sovereignty and compete in this globalizing world, then really we need to overthrow the Qing dynasty altogether. And so there began an underground movement that prepared for a revolution. And the most famous um, kind of organizer of that underground revolutionary movement was the man whose picture is on the screen there. He was a Western trained doctor by the name of Sun Yat-sen. And he had a lot of contacts in the West. He raised money. He helped organize this revolutionary movement until in 1911 when he felt as though um, uh, he felt as though it was uh, ready, the revolution uh, was ready, and they, in fact, did launch this overthrow of the Chinese dynasty, uh, which um, brought about the creation of a republican government at the beginning of 1912. Um, so just a little bit before World War I broke out. It was a shaky government. It, it, there was a lot of infighting. It wasn't clear whether it was going to last, but at least it was a republican government in form. When World War I broke out, and this still relatively young republic was trying to figure out what to do, there were many of these re revolutionary republicans who argued China needed to get involved in the war because if it did, and if it fought on the, the winning side, it would prove to the world that it was a major power that it needed to be taken seriously as a great global power. And it would, ha it would gain a seat at the negotiating table after the war and would, in fact, then be able to voice its concerns and reassert its sovereignty um, at the end of World War I. So in 1917, China declared war on the side of the Allies, which is to say that it joined the side of the French and the British and the United States and the Italians. And it means that they ultimately did choose the winning side of the war. They chose the victorious allied powers to ally themselves with. Chinese men did not actually fight in World War I, but the Chinese recruited tens of thousands of Chinese men willing to go over to Europe and serve as workers in the factories, like these riveters on the screen here, or working in f uh, farms or building trenches. So they did some of the heavy labor that freed up European men to go fight in the battle. And in total, there was about 150,000 Chinese men who participated in World War I. So it was a large number. And China very much felt as though it had contributed to this war effort and looked forward to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 as an opportunity to reassert its great power status and regain some of that territory it had lost in the preceding decades. Now, to get to Sumei Chang, the woman who would be invited to join this Chinese peace delegation going off to Paris, let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, so she was born in 1891, which is to say in the later years of the Qing dynasty. And in fact, her father served the emperor. He served as a bureaucrat um, uh, for the Qing uh, dynasty. But he was somebody who was critical, um, not ready to overthrow the dynasty, but who was in fact critical of the way things were going for China. Um, Sumei Cheng's family was extremely wealthy. She grew up largely being raised by her maternal grandmother and her mother in kind of a huge family compound in southern China. And that is her grandmother sitting in the middle of the screen there, surrounded by all of her grandchildren. Um, so Sumei Chang has the arrow pointing at her on the screen there. Now, Chang was a rebel right off the bat. 
I don't know if any of you have any small children, but sometimes they've got that look in their eye, right? You know that this one's going to be trouble. And Su Mei Chang was one of them. So when she was six years old, her mother and her grandmother came, and, uh, came to her in her bedroom and said, it's time for us to begin to bind your feet. So foot binding was a practice that was still relatively popular among elite families in China in the early 20th century. And it involved when a child, a young girl was getting ready to grow, to bind her feet up tight in, um, in bandages so that it actually broke the arch of her foot and prevented it from growing. And the ideal uh, foot was only about three inches long. But it was an extremely painful process for girls as they were going through it. And the first time that Su they came in and wrapped uh, Su Mei Cheng's feet, she threw a screaming tantrum and tore the bandages off herself. They came in and tried a second time, and she yelled so loud that her grandmother just said, all right, I give up. We're not going to do this with you. And it's actually interesting, if you look closely at this picture, this is Su Mei Cheng's older sister standing next to her. And if you look at her feet, they're much, much smaller than Chang's are. So her older sister had her feet bound. Su Mei Chang refused to have that happen. So she was already a rebel at age six. At age 14, she kicked up a storm all over again when her grandmother announced that she had found her a husband. And uh, that was very typical. Marriages were arranged. A, a, a paternal grandmother was often the one who was responsible for that. They'd found her somebody from a good family. But Su Mei Chang learned that this was a man who was a bit of a playboy and who didn't believe in, uh, that women should be educated. And so going against all tradition, she wrote him a letter and she said, you know what? I'm actually planning to go to Europe to get an education. You should probably go find a wife who suits you better. And that was completely scandalous. And so her family now had to do something with her. So the first thing that they did is they packed her off and they sent her to an American missionary school for girls that um, was open in China and was training young girls. And so there she began learning English and she began learning something about uh, Western ways. Um, also at her request, they agreed uh, to let her go to Japan which was more modern and um, where a lot of this underground activity was happening. And while Chang was in Japan, she made contact with Sun Yat-sen and these revolutionary groups that were getting ready to overthrow the Qing dynasty. So she was completely swayed by their plans. She thought that this is what China needed to move forward. And so she volunteered for the revolution. She came back to China, and without her parents knowing, but with the help of one of her brothers, they kind of set up the family home, uh, home as a revolutionary headquarters. And then in 1911, as things were really heating up, um, because she was in Beijing by that point in time in the north, she volunteered to help smuggle bomb material into Beijing from the, from the coast so that if they needed it to help overthrow the Qing dynasty, that they would have the gunpowder they needed. And that meant that one or two times a week, she got in a train with empty suitcases, went out to the coast, had them filled with explosives, and carried them back to, the, to Beijing. And because she was from a very elite family, she was able to pass through customs without being inspected and got away with all of this. Um, I don't have any pictures of Su Mei Cheng from this era of her life, but this is another extremely famous woman in China by the name of Ku Jin, who also volunteered for revolutionary forces and was caught and was executed for um, similar types of, of um, actions that Cheng was involved with. Well, Cheng rejoiced when the Qing dynasty was overthrown finally, when the republic was formed in 1912, although she was very disappointed, dispirited, when she figured out that the man who was the first president of this new republic had dreams of making himself an emperor, right, of like destroying the republic right off the bat and just creating a new empire. She volunteered to be, the, um, uh, to be an assassin, uh, to assassinate the minister of finance who was helping hold up this guy who wanted to eventually become uh, become a new emperor, although um, the Secret Service ended up recognizing her and the whole plan had to be aborted at the last moment. So at that point in time, Su Mei Cheng now had a price on her head. She'd gotten in enough trouble that uh, her friends let her be known that the, um, that the president uh, wanted her removed. And with that kind of uh, 
sentence hanging over her head, Su Mei Cheng's family allowed her to finally fulfill a dream that she had been nurturing for a number of years, which was to leave the country and to go get a Western education. And so in 1913, Su Mei Cheng sailed out of um, southern China. She sailed all the way um, to Europe, and she got off in Paris and began first um, learning the French language, doing, engaging in intensive language, and then eventually, a couple years later, enrolling at the Sorbonne, which is the elite uh, uh, university in Paris, and she enrolled to study law. She wanted to learn about constitutional law so that she could help her family develop a modern um, constitution. And so she started studying law at the Sorbonne. Um, once she had started studying, uh, just shortly thereafter, World War I broke out in 1914. Um, but Chang, uh, once, it re once it was clear that Paris itself wasn't going to fall to the Germans, Su Mei Chang decided she wanted to stay. She continued her studies, but she was a big supporter of the Allied war effort. Um, she was very eager for China to join in this conflict. And so in 1917, when China did eventually declare war too, Su Mei Chang halted her studies for a while and sailed back home to China so that she could help recruit these Chinese laborers who would come over to help the Allied war effort. And so she was in China in 1918 during the last year of the war, recruiting Chinese workers to come over. And she was then also still in China in 1918 when the armistice came, the war ended, and the Chinese government was putting together a delegation to represent the Chinese in Paris. Now, because um, Su Mei Chang uh, was a diehard revolutionary and Republican, because she spoke French, because she was familiar with the French cap capital, and because she was a woman, the Chinese government decided to appoint her as a member of their delegation. And really, at that point in time, the Chinese delegation thought that that was a sign of their modernity, right? Well, of course, you know, we're able to appoint a woman. They assumed all the Western powers would do the same. In the end, they were the only ones to do so. So Su Mei Cheng left China again to come back to Europe. Um, she came by way of the United States and actually stopped in California at one point, gave some interviews with the press, traveled all the way to New York, gave some interviews with the press there. And then finally in April, early April, she finally arrived back in Paris. And there were um, journalists waiting at the train station when she got off the train in order to greet her and welcome her home. So this was one of the newspaper articles that ran in a Paris newspaper announcing that Mademoiselle Chang had arrived. I'm not quite sure why they thought her first initial was E instead of S, but that's OK. Journalists are confused sometimes. Um, and the headline there says, Mademoiselle Chang, féministe chinoise et francophile sincère, est arrivée à Paris. So the, um, the uh, title to this, the headline, uh, Mademoiselle Chang, a Chinese feminist and sincere Francophile has arrived in Paris. And so she got off the train. They obviously snapped her picture. And the journalist asked her, what are you here to do? Are you here to support women and their efforts at the peace conference? And in fact, by that point in time in Paris, there was a whole group of suffragists organized by the French who had shown up, who were repeatedly knocking on the doors of all the delegates saying, we want to talk to you about women's rights. And so the assumption was, well, she was probably in Paris to join them. And um, uh, Su Mei Cheng told reporters that she had a strong desire to see feminist demands satisfied at the peace conference. So it seemed as though she was probably in Paris mostly to act on behalf of women's rights alongside other female activists in 1919. Instead, a diplomatic crisis erupted almost as soon as she got off the train that completely derailed her plans and set her down a different but equally interesting course in Paris during the peace conference. So one of the, um, uh, well, while it was that the Chinese had these broad aspirations for kind of regaining um, the territory they had lost and regaining great power status, they realized 
they probably weren't going to get everything they wanted. And so the single goal to which the Chinese delegation in Paris attached the most importance was to regain territory that had been taken by the Germans over the course of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And um, to, since Germany had been defeated and had lost all of its overseas territory, to reattach that to China. And so the territory in particular they were concerned about is what's known as the Shandong, or the Shandong Peninsula. You can see it's way up in the north. Beijing is kind of over here. And it was a territory that was economically rich. Um, it was uh, very important uh, in terms of the economy. You all may have heard of the, of, uh, the Shandong because while the, um, while the Germans were there, they taught the Chinese their brewing techniques. And so the Qingtao Brewery, uh, was formed under the Chinese at that, uh, at that time, and of course still continues to make beer today. Um, so there was economic reasons why it was important. It was also culturally very important because the Shandong was the, place, uh, was the birthplace of Confucius, probably the most important sage in Chinese history. So it was kind of like their Jerusalem in a way. It had very important um, cultural significance. And so the one major kind of unrelenting demand that the Chinese had in Paris was to regain the Shandong from uh, what had been the Germans. The problem, though, was that the Allied powers had also signed a number of secret treaties during World War I promising that territory to Japan. And the reasons for that are kind of too complicated to get into now. But by the time Su Mei Cheng arrived in Paris in April of 1919, the, um, the Western powers, and Woodrow Wilson in particular, had disappointed the Japanese on other things they wanted. And they were afraid to disappoint the Japanese again because they thought they might just walk out of this conference. And so shortly after Su Mei Cheng arrived in, um, in Paris, word began to leak out that this peace treaty was probably going to give Shandong not back to the Chinese, but give it to Japan. And that news, um, which had, uh, made, was made public by early May, um, reached China like a bombshell. Um, it took, you know, the, this was the age of the telegraph. It took a little time for word to travel. But as the Chinese people began to learn that, in fact, they weren't really going to get anything out of having supported the war and that they would be treated like a minor and dismissible power, they began pouring out into the streets. Um, it was students, university students, who led this protest. And on May 4th of um, 1919, they spilled out into the big public squares of Beijing. This is Tiananmen Square in 1919, this photograph. And they protested China's treatment. And their message to the peace delegates back in Paris was, do not sign this treaty. This is humiliating. It's treating China like some minor dismissible power. It's ignoring China's sovereignty, ignoring China's right to national self-determination. Under no circumstances should you sign this. So these May 4th, 1919 protests were a big deal. They soon spread all across the country. And um, it, it started what became known as the May 4th movement in China, which is the date from which the Chinese really uh, date the beginning of their own modern um, independence movement. So it's an extremely important date in Chinese history. Well, so the news was um, taken very badly in, back in China. It was taken very badly by the Chinese in Paris as well. And Su Mei Cheng, who was a member of the peace delegation, but who also was herself a student and had a lot of contacts among the young students, stu Chinese students studying abroad, some of these Chinese workers who were still abroad. She began to organize them. Um, she organized one meeting on May 4th where they agreed they were going to send petitions to the Allied leaders and ask them to reconsider this terrible decision. And then on May 9th, she helped stage a big public protest in Paris that was um, attended by over 500 people where they severely criticized this decision on the Shandong, insisting China uh, th that this peace treaty only promised a dark future for China. 
And I just highlighted for you, this was an article about that second protest that ran in the Los Angeles Times on May 11th, 1919. And if you'll see where the arrow is pointing, they noted that among the Chinese speakers were Miss Chang, a well-known feminist, as well as others who had addressed the crowd. Um, so the Chinese students in Paris, and I, I should also say Chinese students all over the world were protesting, including in Berkeley, where there was a large number of Chinese students too. Um, so there was a worldwide movement among the Chinese um, protesting against this movement. So it was clear that the Chinese people were against it, but it was not clear what the Chinese delegates, and particularly the chief delegates, who were the ones who were going to either sign or not sign this peace deal, what it was that they were going to do. Um, clearly there was Chinese pressure not to, but it was also, there was a lot of diplomatic pressure on them to sign. And they really didn't know what would happen if they boycotted the Versailles Treaty. Would the United States you know, write them off? Would they have new enemies all over the world? So it was a frightening situation for the delegates. They did not know what to do. They were madly telegraphing the government in Beijing saying, what should we do? And the government in Beijing was so dysfunctional that it just didn't answer. So it really left it up to the delegates there in Paris to make this big decision all on their own. And, um, and then, on June 27th, 1919, which was the night before the, uh, the signing ceremony that was going to be held out at the Palace of Versailles um, and that was going to seal the terms of Germany's defeat. So June 27th, 1919, the night before this was all going to happen, the chief delegate for China, a man by the name of Lu Shengxiang, disappeared. Disappeared from Paris. Nobody knew where he went. Well, Su Mei Chang said, how am I going to figure out where this guy went? And because she was a woman, she said, well, surely the wives must know. So she began gossiping with all the wives of the other male delegates who were there, and she finally got them to cough up the information that Lu Shengxiang had left Paris and was holed up in a residence in a suburb, a western a suburb of Paris called saint Cloud, or saint Cloud is what it looks like in English. That's just a, a postcard of saint Cloud from that era. And that was troubling news because saint Cloud was outside of Paris and on the way to Versailles. So it seemed as though this man, Lu Shengxiang, was probably trying to escape the crowds in Paris so he could sneak off and sign this treaty without having to face the anger of Chinese students who were um, organizing against him. Um, at the news then that that's where he was, Su Mei Cheng sprang into action. She called for all the Chinese students who could get their act together to meet at the Tuileries Gardens at the center of Paris at sundown so they could go out to saint Cloud and find this guy. Um, she ultimately grew impatient, so she and her good friend of hers pooled all the money they had to hire a taxi cab to take them out to saint Cloud, and they tracked down the address, and they found him at the house that he was hiding out in, and they banged on the door, and he refused to let them in. He ignored them, refused to let them in. Um, night fell came, and eventually a bunch of other Chinese students arrived out at this suburb, so there were several hundred of them milling around in this garden outside of this guy's house. And they kept banging on the door, he refused to open the door, and then a car drove out, um, and in that car was the man who served as the secretary to the Chinese delegation, and in that man's hand was a big bulging suitcase, or uh, not a suitcase, sorry, a briefcase. So the students were convinced, well, that must be all those signing papers that are so important. We need to get our hands on them in order to make sure that he doesn't somehow you know, sign them without our knowing. So he had already snuck into the house, but they prepared to confront him when he came back out. And Su Mei Chang, who had revolutionary experience, looked around her in this garden, and she went over to a rose bush, and she snapped off a branch from that rose bush that was roughly shaped like a gun, and she rubbed it in the dirt so it looked black like a gun, and she put it under her sleeve, and they waited for this uh, secretary to come out. He eventually did. Some of her other male friends tried to reason with him, say, really, this is not in the interest of China. Give up your um, briefcase. He refused to do it. So Chang, hiding it in her sleeve, pulled out her rosebush gun and said, give me that briefcase or else. 
The guy was terrified. He dropped his briefcase, got in the car, and took off. So they managed to hold up this guy with a rosebush gun, and, um, and, but it still wasn't clear what Lu Shengxiang would do. All night long, they stayed in this garden. And then finally, at 10 o'clock in the morning, Lu agreed to open the door and to hear them out. And um, once inside, they hammered home the case for boycotting the treaty. And in her memoir, the one that was being auctioned off today or whatever, she says, um, she recalls, and I have the quote on the screen there too, as the hour of the signing ceremony at Versailles approached, Mr. Liu still sat, a crumbled and sulky figure in a chair, with us firing verbal ammunition at him from all sides. The hour came and went, Mr. Liu did not go to Versailles. On June 28, 1919, China was the only allied state that boycotted the Versailles Treaty, that refused to sign the Versailles Treaty. And while that fact is well known in history, everyone has completely forgotten Su Mei Chang's role in making sure that that happened. So Su Mei Chang clearly played a very important diplomatic role in this conference. The refusal to sign the, sign the Versailles Treaty became a founding moment, as I said, the May 4th protests and this refusal, a founding moment not only for nationalists but in China, but also in co for communists in China as well. So that one of the young students who was involved in these protests, for example, was a young man at the time by the man, name of Mao Zedong, who would turn around and help found the Chinese Communist Party just a little bit later. Um, so the diplomatic importance of this event, I think, is pretty clear. The question is, what about her feminism? Right? She had gotten off the train. She had come to Paris thinking that she was there not just to represent China, but to represent Chinese women in particular and to forward women's rights as part of this new global order that was being sketched out at Versailles. So I want to argue to you that even though she was all tied up in this nationalist battle, she did not abandon her feminist aspirations at any point in time. And we can see this in particular in the ways that she um, spoke to the Western press over the course of, uh, of these events of 1919. Because the Chinese government had, had told her, go to Paris, represent women, represent China, but also you should serve as our media liaison. You should serve as our contact with Western journalists. So she was trying, constantly trying to get interviews in the Western press in order to represent China uh, in the media. Um, and Chang's dedication uh, came out in the way that she tried to prove to Westerners that China was ready to govern itself. And the way she did that, the way she tried to prove that China was a modern progressive nation, was she represented herself as an embodiment of China. She acted the part and spoke the part of a modern, emancipated woman and used that, that reflection of herself, in order to promote Chinese interests. So for example, um, during these peace negotiations in April of 1916, one of the articles that ran about, uh, uh, ran uh, featuring her was in the British newspaper, The Daily Mail. And you see the beginning of it up on the screen there. So there was a journalist, actually a very interesting female journalist, who interviewed Su Mei Chang and tried to find out what she was there. What, what was she up to? What was China up to? And so the beginning of this article, the journalist uh, introduced her by saying, saying to her audience, what do you know, what do most of us know of China? Poetry, light opera, polychrome figures on vases, all evoke images of ladies dressed in glowing silks with curved up eyes, long pointed nails, and painfully small mutilated feet. Some are even pro, uh, view, uh, prone to view China as barbarous, she said. But such old-fashioned thinking is not only ridiculous, it may, it will become a serious danger. And it will be hoped that our peace magnates will keep this in mind. She went on to talk about the amazing Mademoiselle Chang, who was sitting before her that she was interviewing, who was an embodiment of young China itself. 
And Su Mei Chang remained a source of fascination for the Western media throughout the rest of the year and throughout the 1920s and 1930s as well. She was, in fact, for many Western journalists, the, the picture itself of modern China. And so one of the things she did is she dressed very self-consciously, right? She dressed like a young modern woman. And when I say modern woman, I mean M and W in uppercase letters. That was a thing at the time, right? The modern woman didn't wear a corset and old-fashioned poofy dresses. She wore short tailored suits. She had her hair bobbed short. She um, took on this cosmopolitan style of a young modern woman. And um, this was a picture that ran of Su Mei Chang in the New York Times in December of 1919, when she was passing back through the United States on the way back to China after all of this. Um, uh, the other uh, picture I put on the screen there was a multi-page spread that the uh, uh, magazine Good Housekeeping ran of Su Mei Chang in the 1920s. Again, talking about her as the very embodiment of mon modern China. And this way, Chang helped equate modernity, progress, and women's emancipation all at the same time. So she played the part of the modern woman. She played up her own personal story in order to promote China's interests. But it wasn't just a modern woman that, Ch that Su Mei Chang was trying to embody. Because there was another icon, another emblem, that had been very important to Su Mei Chang growing up that also um, uh, fashioned how it was that she promoted herself both at home and in the West. And who is that up there on the screen? Mulan, right? That's Disney's version of Mulan that maybe or maybe not you have uh, heard of or even seen the movie before. But Mulan uh, isn't just a Disney invention. It is an, uh, a very old mythical story in China dating back over a thousand years. It's one of the most told and retold stories. And it's the story of a young girl who disguises herself as a boy and goes off to fight in her father's place. And this story was one that um, Su Mei Cheng tells us her mother told her time and time again, sitting on her knee as a young girl. It's one that continually came back to her over a course of her life as she became a revolutionary, um, that she took as a role model for her own actions. And it's one that she referred to in 1919 as she represented her country abroad as well. So this is that same Daily Mail art, um, interview that we looked at a moment ago in which she um, uh, was responding to the journalist who said, oh, you know, this is such a change, this idea of modern, a modern Chinese woman. And Su Mei Cheng said, no, it's not really a change. This is a return to the past. Um, so here, if you look at this paragraph, she says it's not a change. It is a... I can't read it, looking at this, it is a return to tradition. In old days, Chinese women could become generals and ministers. So by referring back to that mythology of Mulan, she was saying that women's emancipation is part of Chinese history too. And she used that in order to try and forward um, China and women's interests. So just to look ahead a little bit beyond 1919 and tell you a little bit about what Su Mei Cheng became, um, uh, after World War I was over, after she returned to China for a little while, she went back to Paris. She finished her law degree. She got a Juris Doctorate in Law from the Sorbonne in 1925. She was the first Chinese woman to get any degree, let alone a law degree, um, uh, while she was in France. And when she returned back home, she became the first woman, woman licensed to practice law in China. And in fact, she uh, specialized in divorce cases. Divorce was relatively new, helping women to escape troubled marriages um, uh, where they had often um, taken on the status of a second wife or a concubine, um, helping them to restore their rights that way. In 1928, after the Nationalist Party in China finally kind of fully centralized its power in China, she was briefly appointed as a judge she didn't serve for very long, but she was the first judge in modern Chinese history. And then um, in the later 1920s, she was appointed to serve on a five-person commission to draft a civil code for China. 
that would determine the parameters of civil law. So she was one of five people who got to determine, for example, what marriage law was going to stay was going to say, excuse me, she established absolute equality for men, Chinese men and women in marriage, um, that women gained the right to choose their own marriage partners, they gained the right to inherit property the same as men, they gained the same divorce terms as men had, and then the same Chinese um, civil code, the constitution it was part of, also promised Chinese women the vote on the same terms as men um, as in China as well. Now, Chinese history, you may or may not know, uh, was a uh, pretty um, rough time in the 1930s. So as this new constitution was coming into play, was right around the time that the Japanese invaded China, um, eventually taking over large parts of the country in World War II. So this constitution was never fully enacted. After World War II, the Chinese felt in, uh, fought an internal civil war, and the Communist Party eventually came to power. But these basic principles of civil equality that Su Mei Cheng had established for women in marriage were adopted by the communists as well and became the basis of civil law in China um, in many respects right up to the present day. Um, so Su Mei Cheng fought for China in 1919, but I hope I've convinced you she was also in there fighting for women and women's emancipation. She'd play a very important role in Chinese history in making sure that that happened. Su Mei Cheng was not the only woman. In Paris in 1919 or in public in 1919, making these kinds of demands. In addition to Su Mei Cheng, there were Western women who showed up knocking on the peace delegates' doors, demanding that women's rights be incorporated into the Versailles Treaty, and at least in, in small ways, they were successful. There were also African-American women who showed up in Paris in 1919 demanding racial justice, civil rights, and pan-Africanism, um, who also played an important role in this era. There were feminist pacifists, who staged conferences of their own alongside their former enemies, demanding a new type of diplomacy rooted in empathy um, that would also have an effect in this era. There were Egyptian women who took to the streets in their own revolution in 1919, leaving their harems in order to demand an end to colonialism and a modern state in which Egyptian women's um, rights would be protected as well. And finally, there were labor women, working women from the United States, from as far away as Japan, who also staged their own conferences and, for example, established the very first international convention, the first international treaty, demanding things like maternity leave, paid maternity leave for women, a topic which, if you're paying attention to politics, has been raised by our recently elected governor as well as our president just in the past month or so. So beginning a fight that would continue on till today. So I just want to give you a little plug that uh, Professor Reed did it for me, but I'll do it here at the end as well. All of these women, along with Su Mei Chang, are featured in a book that I've just completed writing and is going to come out at the very end of this year titled Peace on Our Terms, The Global Battle for Women's Rights After the First World War. And I hope I've sparked your interest and that you'll want to read about some more of these amazing women when the book eventually comes out. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Well, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And we do have a few minutes for questions. If anybody has um, questions, and we can have a microphone we can bring around here. <laughs> So um, it seems like Sumation was at least a reasonably public figure back then. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think she was forgotten? Good. So the question is, if Sume Chang was, you know, in good housekeeping and in all the press, and she was in the Chinese press as well, why is it that she's so thoroughly disappeared from history? And the answer has in part to do with her politics. 
because while Su Mei Chang was a nationalist, she was not a communist. So when the Communist Party came to power in China in 1949, she and her then, well, I should say she got married in the 1930s. Her husband um, that she eventually married, a friend from law school, became the ambassador to the United States during World War II. So they lived in the United States during World War II. They went back to China. When the uh, communists won that revolution, they went to Taiwan and lived in Taiwan for some period. And eventually, though, when, um, when the nationalists were unable to reassert their authority over to China, she and her husband chose to immigrate to the United States, and she actually died in Los Angeles in the 1970s. Um, but for the communists, while they're willing to celebrate the histories of revolutionary communist women, it was not and is not in their interest to particularly celebrate a nationalist figure who wasn't a communist. And so she was deliberately forgotten in China and um, in the West, where attention to women's history and certainly to Chinese women's history was not a particular preoccupation until very recently, she was forgotten there as well. But I'm going to Paris in June. Um, the Sorbonne and some other institutions are staging a big 100th anniversary conference uh, for the, the commemoration of this Versailles Treaty. And Su Mei Chang's the one I chose to talk about. I want to make sure that they all know her story. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. How did I find her? How did I stumble upon her? And the whole, my whole book isn't dedicated to her. She, she gets a chapter, right? Um, so there's lots of other women who are featured in my book as well. Um, I had been doing some research on a slightly later time period, the late 1920s, 1930s, when Western feminists began trying to reach out for the first time to um, women in Asia more generally. So Chinese, Japanese, and um, Vietnamese in particular, to figure out if they had interests in common and if they could organize together. And the Western women, when they came over to China, Su Mei Cheng served as their French language interpreter. And at that point in time, she just kind of emerged in the archives out of the blue. I had no idea who she was. And um, it's very hard to track her because, um, uh, because people spell her name wrong all the time. And sometimes she published under her married name and not under her own name. So when I began piecing her to, uh, story together and when I read her memoir and read all this, I thought, this, it must be a lie, right? She must have made this all up or somebody would have, have known about it by now. And I contacted a friend of mine who's a Chinese feminist historian who wrote a whole book on Chinese feminists and doesn't talk about her. And I said, why didn't you talk about her? Am I crazy? You know, like, does she not really exist? And my specialist friend said to me, you know, the problem is, um, in part, with some Chinese names, it's very hard to know if they refer to a man or a woman. So she had seen her name as part of the Civil Rights Commission, for example, but had no idea it was a woman. And then also she was more avidly followed in the West than she was in China, although she is in the newspapers there too. Um, so she just missed her. She missed her even when she was there in the historical record. And it took my like working backwards from that, that question to try and figure out who she was. And then I realized that's where the interesting story is. Was there a question behind you? Yeah. Um, so how did her family feel about her political environment, uh, involvement? Um, I have to answer your question a little differently for her mother versus her father. So her mother was somebody from an older generation who had her feet bound, who um, had her husband chosen for her, a man who did eventually establish a separate household with a concubine uh, apart from her. Um, she didn't have education possibilities. And so she very much... Um, told Su Mei Chang, I want you to be able to do what I couldn't do. And you know, when she read, when she told her those stories of Mulan, she said, you take this as a role model. You go out there and you do great things for the woman, women of China. 
Um, Su Mei Cheng didn't tell her about her revolutionary activity right away, uh, but when she did eventually come clean, her mom supported her in it. Um, her father was another matter. Even though he was critical of the Qing dynasty, he was an inherently conservative man and was quite horrified by what his daughter was up to. Never fully dis disowned her, but also kind of just barely tolerated uh, what she was up to uh, over the course of her life. Um, at the, in Paris, you mean, at the Sorbonne? Um, no. So you're gonna, you're, you said you're going to go to the I'm going to go blow their minds. <laughs> they have no idea what's about to hit them. They think they know everything about the Versailles Treaty, and they're about to learn they're all wrong. Mark my words. That's a bold move. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we Sac State professors, we're bold. <laughs> yeah, no, she's really been forgotten. She... Um, just last year, in 2018, she was actually featured in a um, kind of made-for-television docu-series in China. Um, that was the first kind of public telling of her story that I heard about. But it has nothing to do with these events in 1919. It has to do with later when she was serving as a lawyer and, um, and uh, taking, care, or taking on divorce cases in China. One of the divorce cases she took on was a very famous Peking opera star. You know, kind of Chinese opera was really popular in this era. And there were two. There was a male and a female Chinese opera star who married each other, had this scandalous marriage. It turned out the man had lied to her that he had a wife already and tried to make her take on the status of a second wife. Su Mei Cheng represented the woman in this case and got a big settlement out of him. And so it was a big kind of scandalous divorce case in the era and made the newspapers for that. And so um, she was in this docu-series as kind of, you know, like important Chinese legal cases of the past. Uh, but her earlier period as a diplomat and a revolutionary hasn't been discussed publicly at all. <laughs> so how was she accepted as a modern liberated woman back in China? Is that kind of the question? Um, so she, I mean, she went back and stayed for roughly a year or so. She had always wanted to go back to Paris and finish her law degree. That was, that was part of the plan. Uh, but she stirred up trouble while she was back in China, too. So she went back in kind of early 1920, and she had a good revolutionary friend who by then was the mayor of a kind of inland city in China called Chongqing. And he invited her to come to town and kind of talk about her experiences as a peace delegate. But before she, was, uh, before she went to give this big public lecture, she met with some girls in a local girls' school, teenage girls, um, to, you know, one-on-one -on -one to tell them and uh, talk to them. And, and she said to them, you should really come to my talk later. You might be really interested in it. And they said, you know, we're sorry we can't. Our principal won't allow us as girls to come to this big public lecture. And she kind of said, well, if I were you, I wouldn't listen to this guy. I'd get rid of him. And so the girls rebelled, 20-some of them. They rebelled. They came and heard her public lecture. And then with her help, they pressured the local city council to remove their principal and get a new one appointed. And then when she was getting on the boat to go back up the Yangtze River to Beijing, um, uh, she, she says the, the boat was kind of pulling away from the dock and she heard giggling behind her and she turned around and all of those girls had stowed away on the boat and they said, will you take us back with you to Paris? We want to study too. <laughs> and so I'm not exactly sure how it happened, but she essentially went back to Chongqing, negotiated with the families, got their permission and brought roughly 20 girls with her back to China who all went on. So while she was finishing up her law degree, she was also kind of overseeing the education of this handful of young girls, many of whom went on to become doctors and lawyers back in China as well. Um, so she was certainly a uh, controversial figure, but she was a very respected figure. And women's emancipation was really proceeding very rapidly by that point in time in China too. She was a troublemaker. <laughs> Well, thank you again so much. Yeah. I, see some of their faces at <laughs> I hope so. I hope I do. Thank you very much. <laughs>